as a colonial historian uh, who studies that pre-revolutionary period, that that family, its location just outside of Salisbury and the general time period was very interesting to me. The, the, the nature of the operation there on the Handy Farm, it really was the precursor to Salisbury, the town as we know it. It was the, the center of operations on this part of the Wicomico River. So merchant vessels that were coming in from the Chesapeake that would have been really the last stop throughout most of the colonial period, throughout most of the 18th century. Really, up until that time, the Handy property really is representative of a, of a much broader uh, group. It's not just, you're not just looking at Pemberton Hall in isolation. It represents farms of that size. And also, again, as, as, a, as a center of trade, and I don't want to overstate that, it wasn't a booming metropolis or anything like that, obviously, but it was important for any farmers that lived nearby. The ships that would come up to the wharf at Pemberton Hall, that was their best, most reliable connection to a much larger world, out into the Chesapeake, out into the Atlantic world beyond. So for all those reasons, it, it's an important place to, to study, to visit. It's certainly a nice place to go, uh, just uh, to, to see something that's been around for a couple hundred years, but uh, there, there's plenty of importance there. There's been quite a bit of, of research done on the Handy family. That was the family that owned the property, uh, purchased it in the early 1700s, and then began building the structure, again, that, that still stands there, in the early 1740s. It was a fairly sizable family. Um, the actual builder of the house, the owner of the house, was Isaac Handy. His wife was Anne Handy. And they had, they came from a large family, Isaac did, uh, but they had many children of their own. And when, whenever we're looking at a, a farm of that size, um, the, the number of of laborers there, and to best of my understanding, they, they were enslaved laborers. By this point, that was common throughout this area. Really, they had moved away from indentured servitude as the main source of labor and moved towards, towards slavery. We, we know that there was a slave quarters that really should be excavated. All right, we know the basic location of it, but there's not been a thorough archeological excavation of the site. And that would be, that would tell us so much more. We don't know where the slave quarters are. Uh, we know they're east of the house. Uh, one of our goals is to go ahead and find the location of that to interpret slavery. We know the ages, names, ages. We know what happened to a, a couple of the slaves uh, that were born here. We know basic numbers of, of, of people who were there in, in that status, but as far as the size of the buildings that they lived in, or that would give us a much better understanding. You know, how many people were, were, were packed into what we expect would be a, a pretty small dwelling. Um, it would take some good archeology span to figure that out. We're, we're in the process now of doing research to be able to interpret that. That information is extremely difficult to come by. Uh, 
extremely difficult because it was not documented. They were looked on as property, they were looked on as chattel rather than being human beings. And, and uh, so they did not record that information. A uh, full archaeological investigation needs to be done east of the house. Now we've done eight major archaeological investigations out here on the property. So all of those are going to play a part in reconstructing these slave quarters. So we need to find it first. Uh, we need then to go ahead and reconstruct it based on architectural evidence that's available um, and through a lot of research, um, architectural research and um, documentary research of, of slavery here on the Eastern Shore to be able to tell that story. The goal of the Pemberton Foundation is education. So, uh, for example, we have in the past years done uh, more than a thousand students a year on hands-on programs. I mean, that's somewhat lessened off because of the responsibilities in the uh, uh, schools now. Uh, and But we do uh, have the house open. It's open now three days a week. Uh, and through May through October, it's open four days a week. Uh, and by appointment at any time. Uh, we do charge, we have an admission which helps us defray expenses and to do the restoration. So what we're working with now is an attempt to go ahead and carry it to the next plane, which is uh, making it more available to the public for educational purposes. A place like Pemberton Park where, where people can go um, for, for the nature trails, for uh, programming for kids in the summer, programming throughout um, the year on weekends, um, and a taste of history from time to time, um, I think that always makes a place more enjoyable to live. Um, you know, jurisdictions that cut their funding for, for that sort of thing, I, mean, I can't help but see that as a loss for the people who live there. And also there, there is an economic loss when you don't have a place like Pemberton to, to host the wine festival or the, the beer festivals or other things that are out there. You, a, a jurisdiction gives away dollars that, that could have been coming in. So I see places like this as just vital for quality of life. And it's, it's a wide, diverse group of people that use Pemberton Park. So it's, it's not... Certainly, I, I don't pick up on any kind of elitism um, attached to the place. I think it's, it's open at many different hours and, and pretty accessible for people. Mm -hmm.